or any species as any kind of intelligence that involves relationships with other individuals. And that could, depending on the species, manifest itself in deception and trickery, but it also could manifest itself either equally or, more importantly, in forming social relationships that, that benefit you. Thank, thank you. Let me ask the panel if anybody wants to weigh in on the definition of social intelligence or disagree or agree or say what we need to know more about to make it, how do we form that definition or what would, what would inform us to make a different decision, but we need to know more about that. Anybody want to? Wait into that morass, or just let <laughs> no, a lie there. Yeah. No, okay. No thanks. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> yeah. David. Did you want to? Take oh a shot? well, just um, that I agree that Machiavellian intelligence is not really a very useful term anymore because, as Robert was saying, um, we we really need a much broader concept of um, what is important in terms of cognition when it comes to these animal social lives. And that it's not that we've been paying too much attention to competition and so we should now just look at ways that they get along with each other. It's that both are important. And in fact, one thing that is most striking about certainly higher primates, including chimpanzees and bonobos, is the extent to which they cooperate in competing with each other and the complexity of trying to decide, well, who would make a good cooperative partner? Um, and how can I develop a relationship with that individual? And then how can I use it in other ways in my life? Um, so we, we really do need a, a it, it makes sense to have a, a broad definition like yes. Dr. Seifarth proposes. Is there anything we've learned in the last 40 years and maybe the, the latter end of the last 40 years that would make your case a better argument, lead to a better argument for people who don't believe in evolution or are looking for more evidence? Is there some stuff that you have learned or some other, you know, when you, when you talk to people about evolution, they all say, I didn't descend from a gorilla. <laughs> well, you're not show, your tree doesn't show you descending from a gorilla, you know? Is there any argument that you can make about learn new knowledge about where the human ancestry did branch off that might convince people? Or do you just believe that people who don't want to believe in evolution are never going to believe in evolution, no matter what you say to them? Jane? Well, the genetic data, which uh, is not the kind of work any of us do in detail, uh, I think provides the most unassailable scientific evidence about our relationship to other organisms on the planet and our, our genetic relationships to them. But your own people don't want to sit still for like, you People know, don't want to sit still for that. Uh, we, know <laughs> that in the, we know that in the current, this uh, political election, professorial has become uh, a, an insult, <laughs> yes. not a compliment. Uh, but, you know, though, that's the data, okay. and, uh, uh, and if, but bringing people to, I mean, I am, I teach courses, I teach courses in human evolution, and I think that the way to bring people to understand what those facts mean is by explaining to them how evolution works. And, um, you know, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So I think, I mean, our job as scientists is to bring data that are relevant to these questions to people and explain why they matter. And then, and this is one of the great outreach functions of the Leakey Foundation, and then people will decide, you know, how persuasive these arguments are. Okay. Well, let me get you a mic. Let me get a mic over here. I think w one th one thing that that biologists be believe in come that on, come really up, come on all, up and turn around all all members of the of the general public everyone in the U S any uh, country um, implicitly accepts two things that biologists bring to them and one is um, the relevance of genetic relatedness and two is the experimental or the analytical method. Every time you take a medicine, 
you take a medicine that only came to market after it was tested on species that are closely related to us, because they're closely related to us, and it was tested using experiments whose rules are set up by science. So anytime you take an aspirin or any kind of medicine for a heart condition or anything else, you're implicitly going along with two fundamental elements, relatedness through genetics and the experimental method. Now, what we're doing here is we're applying those tools to behavior and to other sorts of social organization. So we're really just taking the tools that everyone always accepts and applying them a little bit more broadly according to the same general rules. So if you buy into the system, you buy it all. Yeah. Johnny That's Carson good. used to say. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, a familiar face at the microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so have humans evolved in the last 50,000 years? If so, how? And are we still evolving? Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, have we evolved in the last 50,000 years? Um, well, almost certainly, yes. Um, and let, let me give you, a, uh, building on what Robert just said, let me give you a couple of quick examples. And first of all, well, I might mention also that 50,000 years ago, there were still Neanderthals in Eurasia, Western Europe, the Iberian Peninsula and so on, and most people who study human evolution now would say that they went extinct. Um, and there are arguments about, did, was there any interbreeding between us, that is fully modern Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthals, and um, that's not completely resolved now. Um, I won't try to explain the argument to you, but... Um, we had those little hobbits that, that popped up for a while. <laughs> keep, keep that in mind. Let me give you two quick examples. Malaria. Um, we have uh, identified a host of physiological variants, um, most having to do with the form of hemoglobin molecules, um, in people that occur, that are completely absent in people from some parts of the world or whose ancestors are from some parts of the world and reach appreciable frequencies in people whose ancestry is in other parts of the world. And the, lo and behold, the frequency of alleles, that is the genes that underlie this variation, maps very nicely onto the frequency of, or the, the, the relative intensity of malaria as a force in these people's lives. Um, and, and we also can be fairly certain that there's been recently, within the last several thousand years, with the development of agriculture and forest clearings and changes in the local ecology of people um, in habitats where malarial mosquitoes were present, tremendous selective pressure in favor of any mutations that led to some resistance against malaria. Um, and the other one is HIV. And that is exerting serious selective pressure on people now. And we, again, getting back to chimpanzees and what might they tell us about humans and are they related to us? Well, it turns out that HIV-1 in humans apparently came from chimpanzees. It's evolutionarily related to SIV chimpanzee. Chimpanzees do not get sick from being infected with SIV, so far as we know. And yet this new pathogen, when it jumped the species barrier and got into humans, was intently pathogenic. Um, it's slow acting, but um, also some people have resistance to it, just like apparently all chimpanzees have resistance to SIV. Um, so we're under intense selective pressure now in favor of anything that will confer resistance to the effects of HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne, did you want to? Uh, I need a mic. Yeah, go ahead. Is your mic working? Can you hear me? Yes, your mic's working. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'd actually like to comment on the SIV part. Oh. Is there a mic okay. working? No, okay. Um, David's talked about SIV in chimps as not being pathogenic. Um, the, there's been a, a lot of study recently by Beatrice Hahn who's looked at the prevalence of SIV across chimpanzee 
um, populations over Africa.